Okay, thank you. And, and as Cassie noted, this is being recorded for folks who couldn't join us. Um, so thank you to those who joined us. This uh, brown bag is our first time doing this uh, for SIAC. And so this one is about a challenge that we have coming up in just about a month and a half. So uh, if you could use the chat to ask questions, we're gonna be pretty informal, but as we go, if you wanna put questions in the chat, that'd be great. So if you could go ahead. So at the, at the SIAC monthlies, you usually just hear a little snippet about what we're doing and you don't usually get to meet any of our other team members. So I really wanted to take the opportunity today and introduce Rusty Lowe, who is our science lead for the Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper. Uh, many of you probably already know Rusty. Uh, she is an incredible scientist and educator. And Cassie Sofing, who is the Globe Mission Mosquito Campaign Coordinator and the lead for informal education. But Cassie also has under her belt much experience with formal education um, from middle school up to adult learning. So both of these folks are on our team are incredible and they are the leadership for the Globe Mosquito Habitat Mapper and the Globe Mission Mosquito Campaign. So if you could go to the next slide. So today we wanted to give you some more in-depth information about the Mosquito Habitat Mapper, um, starting with why NASA is interested in mosquitoes the challenge that's coming up and how to use the Globe Observer app, why this challenge and how you can help, resources you can use in your programs, and we're looking for partners. This is something new that we're doing, but we wanna reach out to our SIAC colleagues and see if you would be interested in partnering with us for this challenge. So if you go to the next slide. So important note as we start. So this investigation, Mosquito Habitat Mapper, is focused on mosquito larvae. They do not bite, they do not transmit disease or pose a health hazard, but whenever you're outside during mosquito season, there's a chance there's going to be adult mosquitoes. So we want to emphasize safety first, and safe practices include insect repellent, long sleeves, shirts and pants, covering or clearing water. Doing this is helping to keep your community safe as well as contributing data that's, that's important to NASA and NASA scientists. So if you go to the next slide, I'm gonna hand off to Rusty. Thank you, Teresa. So um, thanks so much for coming to this uh, presentation. And our goal um, during this brown bag is to maybe get you a little bit excited about the ways in which you can engage your own audiences in this um, pretty exciting camp, um, campaign challenge that we're gonna be having over the, the summer. It's gonna start uh, the 25th of July and it's gonna run till the 25th of August which in here in the US for men, in many places is sort of a big mosquito season. So we're really hoping that you'll, um, you'll find a way to connect what we're doing with you know, your, own, your own education outreach objectives. And that's really why we're having this talk today. And so the, you know, I just wanted to open up with this is that you know, the question I always get when I talk to people about mosquitoes is like, why is NASA interested in mosquitoes? You can't see them from space, so what is it all about? And the answer is, of course, that uh, NASA satellites um, you know, are monitoring environmental parameters and they are then seeking out and finding you know, where, it's, where it's moist, you know, where the temperatures are warm enough, when the humidity is right, what the land cover is, because all these factors um, go into when and where we find mosquitoes. And so these data are regularly used by scientists who are creating predictive models of vector-borne disease um, that's used um, to improve human health. And so um, this is one real reason. The second reason, and actually the reason why I got involved uh, with mosquitoes as a climate uh, person, is that climate change is changing where we're finding mosquitoes and when we're finding mosquitoes. There are places in the States where the mosquito season is 57 days longer than it was in 1980, okay? Some places like Honolulu, it hasn't changed at all, but from state to state, you can see that there have been real changes. These changes are because of changes in climate. 
Um, so that's important. And then the last thing is because of changes in climate, as well as globalization, we also have these new invasive species that are really causing problems. And they, when they come, they come with the potential to transmit disease. And so we are also monitoring where and when those mosquitoes are found, because this is a real new hazard for us when it comes to mosquitoes. And we'll talk maybe a little bit about that very at the very, very end. All right, so on the next slide, um, uh, th this is the important thing that I wanna say is that citizen scientists, you know, the globe observers that we're talking about, we're making that connection between mosquitoes and space. Space provides, provides us with um, those environmental parameters I already talked about, including land cover. And if you use these two tools, the Mosquito Habitat Mapper and the land cover tool, both that are on the Globe Observer platform, we will be able to uh, provide data that will assist in the actual um, use of, it complements the data that's, that is um, obtained remotely uh, using satellites. Next one, please. So, what we want to do um, in this particular challenge, but in general, is we really want to understand where we find these larval habitats. We know in urban areas, they find mosquitoes like to find themselves in flower pots. Any place that there's standing water and a little bit of shade will look to a mosquito mom who wants to bear her, her eggs um, as, a good, as a good nursery. Uh, but also there are, of course, mosquitoes um, use natural habitats as well. And what we want to do is we want to try and find those and record those. And we're, we're developing a, a database, which is critically important to people who study vector-borne disease, including the ecology of where we find these vectors in space, as well as um, those people who are creating models. So this is all really important. So the one thing that we wanted to say here is that, you know, when we're doing this challenge, we're going to be using two tools. We're going to use the Mosquito Habitat Mapper, because there you're going to say, where is the source of the water? And the water could be um, something natural, like a lake or a pond or a swamp, or it could be something like a container, like an old tire or a flower pot. But we can pair these um, observations with environmental data, and this is going to improve the models that scientists are doing. And this is an area where, where research is just beginning. So it's really kind of cool that we're in this place able to do this. Next one, please. So the Mosquito Habitat Challenge uses the Globe Observer app. We are using these two tools. And next one, please. We will see that, um, you know, if you have not used the, the Globe Observer app, I hope you'll download it and try it. It's, it's pretty easy. Um, there's going to be um, an update that's going to be coming in up um, sometime in July, probably uh, late July, and but before the um, before the challenge, and you're going to have um, a, a new and improved um, interface. And these are pictures of the new improved interface that we have in the app. But basically the steps are easy. You just open up the app, the uh, GPS um, uh, receiver in your mobile device automatically identifies the latitude and longitude. You also have the date and the time. Um, there's a little accuracy bar on the bottom. You press that a couple times until you get between six to say eight or 12 meters if you can, because that's, um, that's about the accuracy that you're able to get using a mobile device. Um, and then you just say, where's the source of the water? Well, I'm looking at um, um, a flower pot. I'm looking at a tire. And then you're, it, you uh, will take some pictures of that habitat. And then there's some additional questions. If you want, you can um, count how many larvae you have. You actually can go in and then using the uh, built-in key, you could actually tell us whether or not you have one of these three important genera that are um, medically important around the world. And then we ask you to photograph it. So this is a photo, it's called the Mosquito Habitat Photo Challenge. And we wanna get pictures of the photographs of the habitat. We wanna get photos of the habitat using the land cover, which gives you a broader sort of context and perspective. And then we want photos of the larvae. Okay, next one, please. So he, I just threw this in just to show you that 
these habitats are everywhere. And once you start looking for them, you'll find them in all kinds of places. So these are just some of the in, a new, these are some of the, the places that we've, we have found um, doing field work. Some of them are unusual. Some of them are sort of predictable, um, but yeah. And if you find a potential habitat, but there's no, but there's no mosquitoes in it. So if, if you find standing water, but there's no mosquitoes, it's still a habitat, but it's a potential habitat. So we want you to record zero larva because that's important because zeros are important data when we begin to look at data and analyze it statistically. So you definitely do wanna have that. Okay, so the next one, please. So you're almost done now. Once you've taken the you've taken those pictures using the mosquito habitat mapper, we want you to open up the land cover app and you can make a land cover observation. And this is also very, very easy to do. Next one, please. Especially because uh, we're just asking you to take pictures. So you'll see that if you remember the, the previous slides, the apps are designed so that they are, the learning curve is really low. If you've done one of them, you can do all of them. So the same thing, the latitude, the longitude, time and date are automatically um, um, ported into the interface. You press on the estimated accuracy button just a few times to um, enable your um, GPS receiver to go out and ping those satellites up there, try and get an estimated accuracy of 12 meters or less. And then because this is, we're relating this work, of course, to uh, land cover images from space, we want to make sure that, what, um, that we can help people look at that spectral data and make sure that they're not confusing snow and ice or standing water uh, from clouds or from other kinds of features. And so we ask you to identify those surface conditions. And then here's the last step, take six pictures, next. So in these pictures, um, we're just gonna ask you to take pictures up and the picture up tells you a little bit about whether or not there's cloud cover that's gonna be obscuring this picture. Um, it also, sometimes if you've got trees in there, it'll tell you a little bit about the canopy cover. So these are really important pictures. Down here, I took this in, in May, okay? But you've got, you have here some snow um, in the down pictures. And then just, you take pictures north, south, east, and west. And you try to, if you can, get about a soccer field's worth of, of space in your view. So you don't, you don't set it so that you can see forever and ever, but you try to get about 50 meters in each direction. And that is just, that's, that will just sort of standardize these photos just a little bit. And you see these com compass marks, north, south, east, and west. Uh, so you don't even have to have a compass to do this because the app tells you when you're facing the right direction. All you do is line up the circles and it either will take a picture automatically or you tap the screen and it will take a picture. So super easy. Next one. And the other thing is that there is, you could go on and if there are some badges, there's the land cover observer, which you have to do. It takes about three minutes to do that little tutorial um, in order to take pictures. And if you wanna become a land cover expert, uh, which allows you to um, assign percentages to the vegetation you see, like, oh, there it's 70% grass and there's 30% is the road. You could actually do that, but that's time consuming. And we're not asking for that for this challenge. So if you wanna do it, fine. But what we really need for this challenge are the photos. And we're gonna explain that in a minute. Okay, next one, please. Okay, so I just wanted to give you this example of why it's important to take pictures of both the photo of the habitat and the land cover. And so here, if you look on the right, this is, um, this is a photo that I took. This is near where I am. It's out in rangeland, um, just a few uh, miles um, east of me. And you'll see it's pretty dry. It's a semi-arid high plains. Um, there isn't a lot of live vegetation. Um, when this picture was taken, this picture was taken, I think in August. Um, so yeah, where would there be mosquitoes there? Well, the picture on the above left there is a little stream that is actually found in those photos. It's too small to see, but it's there and there are mosquitoes there. 
And so this is why we need to have, because if you just had just that one picture of that lush stream, you would have a very different impression of what the land cover is like, right? So we really want that context. And that's why we need you to photograph the site. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. So one of the reasons why we're having this challenge, I think this is the first challenge that we have ever run that we're actually supporting five different research teams. And so this is very exciting for us because we've all along known that this data is really important. Um, it took a couple years for scientists to sort of clue in that this data is available. But um, this, da this data challenge is supporting current research uh, through the National Science Foundation, so scientists at the Uni University of Florida, um, who are developing um, um, an artificial intelligence, some, some um, they're using machine learning to develop algorithms that will automatically identify larvae. In the future, we're hoping to have those images available so that if, if people are using the Skeeta Habitat Mapper and they've identified something, then they can confirm their identification using the AI or vice versa. Uh, the second um, one is we have four new science teams that were just funded um, in, I believe, in March. Um, they will start working either in August or in uh, September or December, and they will be working with these photos, these exact photos that we're asking for, to label and classify land cover and mosquito habitats. And mosquito habitats, um, we, look at, we look at those as being high resolution land cover, right? So instead of having the 50 meters that we usually have in that viewscape, those sort of oblique pictures that we're taking using a globe observer, instead we're taking up something up close and personal, maybe maybe three meters or maybe two meters that has actually that that habitat in there. But the same um, algorithms uh, can probably uh, will be working with both of these. Okay, next one, please. All right. So this is um I promise this isn't too long. It's just about a minute long. But this is um, one of the collaborators that I'm working with um, at the University of South Florida. This is the PI, uh, Ryan Carney, and he's gonna talk just a little bit about why the mosquito habitat ma mapper data is so important. If there are any questions too, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat or we'd be very happy. We, we, we're, we have plenty of time today. So if you'd like to just um, um, unmute and speak up, we'd love to hear from you too. So Tracy had a question that's in the chat that other people might be interested in. And if I'll let people look at that if, if Rusty's ready to do the, the video. Well, I'll just say right now, I can answer that question, Tracy, because it's a great question. And the answer is yes. In the new update, when you finish your mosquito habitat mapping data collection, it will say, will you please go take, a, take pictures with the land cover app? So yes, that's going to be available. It's currently not on the app, but it will be by the time we have the challenge. It's something we've been wanting for a long time. Thanks. Yeah, okay, just a, a quick follow up, real quick yeah. on that. Um, do you know if the if the other um, measurements will also have links? Like for example, if you do a land one, will it will it prompt you to go to clouds? You know that kind of thing, or is this the mm -hmm. only? link that they're planning. I think we should have more of those links, but uh, yeah. with respect to land cover, uh, they already have um, links to say, um, do you want to take a mosquito habitat measurement? Do you want to take a tree measurement? Um, I think trees doesn't have that yet. And I don't think clouds has that yet. But you know, it's it's sort of like slowly, slowly, the glacier goes across Minnesota and the Pleistocene, you know, um, you know, we have to, you know, the updates happen when there is funding available to do that. And so we're kind of, it's all kind of staggered, but that's a great question. And I think that is the plan. Okay, thank you, Tracy, great question. Uh, go ahead, Cassie, do we have the video available now? A global surveillance system that is uh, real time and leverages both the citizen science platforms of Mosquito Habitat Mapper, Mosquito Alert, and iNaturalist, along with uh, the computational uh, artificial intelligence, diecast cluster modeling and habitat modeling as well. So we'll be able to uh, scale up the identification and find those 1% you know, of mosquitoes that are 
uh, transmitting diseases to humans as well as detect any of those invasives. So we can create things like real-time maps, whether it's disease risk maps or distribution maps that mosquito control can then use for targeting surveillance and control and ultimately lead to fewer mosquitoes and less disease. So basically in this diagram, what you're seeing is you have an individual there who is your citizen scientist who's going to be um, making observations. You also have people who are mosquito professionals as well. And um, what they're showing here is we're looking for mosquito habitats like you find in tires uh, with, um, with um, West Nile virus, um, uh, uh, dead birds is another proxy for the, um, the persistence of the virus in a particular location, and also looking at adult mosquitoes. And then those go into these, in the red box there, those are a bunch of different models that are being used. But you see in the bottom box there, we have mosquito habitat mapper, there's iNaturalist and mosquito alert. Um, uh, th those are three, well, two apps and um, a website that uh, is collecting data. So with iNaturalist, this is a, a great way to collect adult data because we do not do that at NASA. Um, the Mosquito Alert is a um, also looking at adult mosquitoes, but we are the only ones that are providing that larva data. So that's really important. Okay, thank you very much. And we can now move on. So, so here, I just wanted to tell you, because I'm very, very excited about this. Um, this is the Goddard had set up last year, the AI Center for Excellence, and they put out a request for a proposal to um, work with um, Globe Observer, Mosquito Habitat Mapper, and Land Cover Data. And so these are the uh, four teams that are grantees for this next year doing this work. Uh, you can look at the names of these, like the, of the titles. It's pretty cool, like hack the life, the land out of them. So, you know, all of these are um, going to be a community facing AI projects that will engage communities and people. These are also things that we can connect you with in the future uh, once they get go going either in August or in December. Um, and um, they will be using the data that's collected during this campaign to do this research. So we really, really want to provide lots of photos to make this happen because in order to actually develop, you know, um, machine um, uh, learning algorithms, you need really tens of thousands of photos. And so that's why citizen science is now playing a big role in a lot of AI work that's being done right now. Okay, thank you very much and let's go on. Okay, so this is, um, I have this picture here just to talk a little bit about the land cover, uh, about the different kinds of features. So if you go in, just taking those pictures, north, south, east, west, up and down, um, that's gonna tell you just a little bit about this particular area. And each of the photos that you take is going to be describing these, these six photos that you're gonna take, you know, four of which are sort of oblique photos in situ from the ground are going to be describing one of these little dots that we have on um, this land cover photo here, which is a high resolution photo. Okay, next one, please. And it's an image, not a photo. Okay, good. So here's the data needed by science teams. For the mosquito habitat mapper, um, uh, Ryan Carney and, and uh, Sri Chelapam and, and that team, they really need larvae photos. They need to be clear and in focus. The more we have, the better the AI will be. And um, importantly, they are asking for um, more than one photo. You know, in the app, you can take up to nine photos. And so, um, and one of the problems with uh, mosquitoes and other organisms is they're three-dimensional, right? So if you take a picture going down, you're only seeing one view. So if you were able to take a, a probe or a toothpick or a little brush and sort of move around a larva, flip it over or just change its position, you'll be able to see some other features that might be very useful. And especially we wanna see those hairs and close-ups of the head, the thorax and the, um, the tail end. Um, and so, like I said, you can take up to nine and they'll be stored in the app. So that's really great. Uh, for land cover, um, we want to have pictures of um, land cover in six directions, north, south, east, west, up and down. And um, we, you know, we're looking for land cover photos that have water in them. 
that's another part of this uh, thing. So um, most of the water sources that you find in land cover, you know, might be moving water and they may not be a great mosquito habitat, but I will tell you, I've got a creek right outside my yard. It's a it's it's going great gowns right now, just really bubbling away because we have the spring melt coming on, but there's little pockets where the water has pooled, pooled in and mosquito moms have used those little stagnant pockets along that stream to lay their eggs. So you're always getting bit by mosquitoes, even though it's a moving creek. So if there's water, it's a take a picture. And the more pictures, the better. Thank you so much. All right, next one. This is where we're where you come in. We would really, really like it a lot if you would. Um, let your, um, your stakeholders and your audiences know about this challenge. Uh, we're here to help you. We can provide any materials that you need or training or whatever you think needs to be in place to make this happen. Um, we have lots of materials that we are gonna show and share with you. And if you would like to, to partner, maybe do a mosquito day on a Saturday, for instance, or something like that, we can help tie what you're doing in your regular programming to what we're doing with the mosquitoes and land cover. So please reach out. Um, we wanna be a resource to you as well as asking for assistance so that we get all the photos we need for this project. Okay. So here is um, a um, handout. You can get it at this website here, uh, but it's just a one pager and it just tells people what we need and why it's important. Um, and it has the steps to get involved. So it's, it's pretty simple. So you could make this available to folks. All right, and the next one, please. And so we um, are going to have a kickoff webinar where we're going to uh, go into this in a little bit more detail, but not a lot more detail. So please come to our kickoff webinar or please let people in your, in your communities of practice and your audiences know about this because we would just love, even if you just do one day, that will increase our numbers and also the diversity of habitats and mosquito habitats that we are actually um, able to use in the training of these algorithms. So it's really, really important. So please share and um, come to that um, webinar. And then I just wanna say that one of the things that we, instituted with these Globe Observer challenges that, that started during the pandemic was a little bit of increased um, emphasis on things that were outside the field because during the pandemic, we did not wanna tell people to go outside if they did not feel safe to do so. But as it turns out, this is a, it turns out to be wonderfully motivating. And so for each one of the, um, observe, learn, create, and engage. We have selected four activities that people can do as part of the challenge. Great. So anyway, we've got these resources out. And so we have, uh, this is our little activity tracker that will tell you about where, what kinds of things you can engage your audience with. And the next slide is um, Globe Observer. Um, here is the uh, discussion on the website that talks about the mosquito challenge. And uh, we have other uh, websites that you can um, go to. Um, we have the Mission Mosquito, Globe Mission Mosquito uh, website. We are also on the Globe Observer website. They, we have a little bit more in detail materials on the, um, on the official um, campaign website. All right. Um, we do have lots of great resources. We've been doing this now for uh, three years and we have a lot of really good things. We have a video library um, that shows you how to use the clip-on magnifier to take photos, how to sample, how to identify mosquitoes. And we also have a bunch of res other resources that you can take a look at. And here's the good news that um, that this is a SciStarter affiliate project, which means that if you <coughs> are a SciStarter participant, you can um, use the dashboard to, re to register your participation and also earn badges. 
So that's also pretty exciting. And that goes not just for land cover and mosquito habitat mapper, but also for trees and clouds. Well, and if you're working with Girl Scouts, you can go to this, the Girl Scout Journey badge part of, of SciStarter too. We have resources and we have them identified by how long it would take to do them and what kinds of activities there are. So you don't have to go through all the different resources to find the thing that you want for your um, for whatever kinds of um, um, inter interaction you're going to be doing with your participants. But you can see that you can choose your audience um, for each of these resources. And you can choose what kind of um, age of resource that you have and uh, whether or not you're working with um, citizen science or informal educators or students. And some of our resources are in Spanish. For example, the Smithsonian Mosquito Community Resource Guide that Rusty was part of. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. And then finally, um, here are some hand-on activities and games. If you're doing informal science or camps, these things are great, are great for that. All right. So anyway, here's just some pictures of some of these things. Um, we all have favorites that we, um, that we really like on this. I will tell you that I have taken those uh, on the left. Those are cootie catchers, you know, those, th those origami things that you can put together and you can go like this and you, and you ask each other questions. Well, we have five cootie catchers that are designed for teaching about mosquitoes. And so the as you go through the cootie catcher, um, and I, I'm sure there's a better name for that, um, but as you go through it, um, at the end, there's a true false question about mosquitoes. And there's one um, for diseases that are carried by 80s mosquitoes. There's one that talks about Culex mosquitoes and West Nile virus. There's another one that talks about protecting yourself from mosquito-borne disease. There's another one about mosquito habitats and so on and so forth. So there's, you know, you can choose one of those if you want and distribute those as well. And there's a DIY where you could, the kids in your programs could create their own. Okay, and yeah, Tracy asked a question about taking larvae pictures without the lens magnifier. And the answer is yes, you can take pictures of the, um, of, the, of the mosquito, you can get a pretty good image if you use, a, um, if you use your um, digital zoom on your, on your uh, camera, you can get um, photos. But in order for those photos to be good enough to identify, you do need to have that magnifier. They're not expensive, they, um, they range anywhere. They were like $3, they're now like what, $5 Cassie, up to about $8 but um, we can tell you more about where to get those as well. Bonnie had us a question about the uh, science notebook. Um, do you want to pull that up as a flip book, a flip snack, and show her that while we're, this is how we're looking for partners. So the science notebook is a way for kids to learn all about the mosquito ecology and their environment. An introduction, how to meet the mosquito, a lot of reflective questions, mosquito life cycle. We also have a few of the pages done as an interactive Google notebook. And we have mosquito larva hunters are the next installments in the in the notebook and that's mission to first identify the difference between a, an actual larva and an imposter larva. And so you build your skills before you get into the app. And then the Mosquito Larva Hunter 2 that's in review right now is um, working through the classification so that when you get to the app, you'll have some great identification skills behind you. Mm -hmm. And that will be it's almost ready now. So when we get it ready, it'll be available before we have the challenge. The notebook is beautiful. Thank you so much. We have a yes, wonderful artist is. that works with us and some very talented um, educators that have just built these, the, this um, notebook. And it really has a kind of a fun component to it. It's written in, in a way that's a little bit fun. So I really like it too. 
Okay. Um, are there any other questions? I think that was the end of the slide stack. Am I right, Cassie? Almost. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah, I wanted to, <laughs> this was an important <laughs> one for me. So one of the reasons why we have NSF funding to do this work is that there are two new mosquitoes that have never been in the US ever. And um, one of them is Aedes scapularis and one is Aedes vitatus. And we have had one observation, I believe it's of Aedes scapularis and it was found in Florida. This is a little bit terrifying because these mosquitoes um, are mosquitoes that can transmit a lot of those tropical diseases that are so frightening and so deadly, including dengue, yellow fever, um, as well as St. Louis encephalitis. So, um, so yeah, so scapularis has been found in Florida. And then we're really worried about potatoes. Potato is apparently a very competent vector, which means not all mosquitoes are that are really that good at transmitting disease. Some of them kind of can do it sort of half-heartedly. Some of them, their biology is just fine-tuned so that the, the pathogen just you know, really quickly and um, capably re um, reproduces in their gut and in their body, gets into their blood, and then, um, and then can be transmitted to humans. Aedes vitatus is one of those. So we found it just last, last fall in Cuba and the Dominican Republic. And so people think it probably already is in Florida, but we're not sure. So we're looking for that. So the work that we're doing, trying to take pictures of these, these mosquitoes is really on the sort of the cutting edge of um, trying to protect people in the United States and around the world from vector-borne disease. So I just wanted to, I, I just wanted to share these uh, posters with you. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay. We had some bonus slides in here. We wanted to just share with you on photo for photo tips, just making sure your accuracy is as close as you can, 12 meters or less. And Rusty pointed out that if you click the reset down here, give it time to recalibrate, it should kind of mm -hmm. narrow, narrow it down for you. Yeah, I did a, I did a land cover of photos yesterday out in um, a state park. And you know, I, I, when I came in, it said 64 meters. I pressed it right away, it said 32. I pressed it right away, it said 16. I pressed it again, it said 16. I waited about 20 seconds and it was at 12. And then I got it to eight and it wouldn't go any further. But you know, it just takes, it takes probably less than a minute. And if you take the time to reset, you'll get much better uh, geolocational accuracy. So that's a, a pro tip. Another pro tip is when it says here, can you see mosquitoes in your in your water? You know, you can you can say yes or no, but right now, and with the app that it, as it is now, we want you to say yes, and then you can just say how many larvae do you have and say zero, because the way the app was set up previously, we were not getting that important zero data, and we realized that right away, and we're trying to change that. Always say you want to make a count and then say zero, even if you see nothing, because that's helpful. And you know, this is a, this is a really nice graphic that, that, that artist that does all that fun stuff can also do really technical drawing as well. But you'll see this just, you know, if you, once you get a, um, um, a magnifying device, there's a little bit of confusion sometimes on how to use this. People always just put it on and then look at it from, from here. And what you want to do is you want to take that little plastic collar at the bottom and place it directly on the plate or the, the, the surface where you have that larva, because that's the way you'll get it into focus. And it's, it has a fixed focal. I love this, this particular um, uh, microscope um, attachment because it's a fixed focal length, which means there's no messing around with trying to get it in focus. It makes it really easy for people to use, including kids. Okay. And then if you have the chance to take pictures of, I remember I said that he really want, they really want pictures of the head, the thorax, the sort of the wide body part and the tail end more than anything else. And so if you could take a couple pictures of those using your digital zoom, that would be awesome. 
that is everything. All right. So thank you so much for this brown bag. I hope you guys all enjoyed your lunch. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes. If anybody has any questions, I would love to answer them. Cassie can as well as so can Teresa. And we'll post the recording of this webinar and the slides where you can get those as well as all the links. Oh, I have a I have a quick question. Do you have any um, anybody you're working with in Hawaii on on the photo challenge yet? We do. Um, uh, there is a um, a senior organization which is called the um, by senior I mean over fifty, so not that old. But there's <laughs> um, something called the um, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. It's found in thirty and thirty states around the country including Hawaii. And um, we have an in there where we have been working with um, the one in uh, Honolulu uh, for the past two or three years. They are trained in using all four of the Globe Observer protocols. And so that's a partner. There is also um, a very active uh, school there that is using the app as well. And we're getting lots of measurements from them. Um, so yeah, we, we, do, we do have a strong relationship with um, Hawaii. And we're do you, really do you know what the school is, Rusty? You know, I don't have the name of it, but I can okay. find it for you. So I'll let you know, no Tracy. I'll let okay. you know, Tracy, because uh, I, I know that because I've been talking to um, the person who runs the Ollie. And we, okay. we, okay. we hope to, to actually, one of the things we hope to do is to get those kids at the school, maybe and get them engaged in a, um, in a K to gray kind of experience with the adults at some point in time, maybe in the fall. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, would love to love to we we work with um, STEM director out there. And so she's got a lot of different schools. And so I want to oh, I, I don't want to double up. That was my point. I didn't want to double up and have, you know, I was like, oh, we're working with so and so already. So, no, okay, you know we'll, what? I, I, I do think that it will be really wonderful if you would make that connection and I will I'll ping you. Perfect. Thank you. OK, good. All right. Are there any other questions? If not, we can. Uh... There was a question in the chat about having all these links and resources. And one thing I was going to note, there is a, a challenge website, which was one of the slides that Rusty put up, and it'll have all of this information. Right now, that's getting built out, but it'll have all of these links to these resources and tips and all the information related to the challenge. Mm -hmm. And here's another thing too, is like, you know, we're sort of identifying this and kind of as we're going, right, Teresa. So yeah. if you find ways that we can, that, um, that would serve you better or better ways to get this information out to you, uh, we would love to have that feedback as well, because we hope this won't be the last challenge that we do, hopefully, you know, trying to engage all of SIAC, because I know we all have the same goals and we all want to work together and we all have different things that we can contribute. So um, I, for one, am really excited about, you know, the potential of having some partnerships for this, for this challenge. Okay, April, yes, we would love for you to mention this and we can give you materials that you need. So uh, Cassie will reach out to you and make sure that you have access to those things, even before they're all available to the rest of the community. Great, thank you. Well, I think we're done. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Rusty. And thank you, Cassie. As, as you can see, you got a lot more detail um, hearing it from the experts. So I really appreciate them both being here today and, and doing a really great job presenting. So, mm -hmm. And can I just say one more thing is that, um, you know, with respect to this work with the AI, um, it's not it's not specifically part of the Mosquito Habitat Mapper project, but we are co-PIs on that pro on those projects. And um, one of the things that's going to be happening with with this work that's being done is there are going to be some public hackathons um, that are going to be um, may, you know, going to be broadcast to the broader NASA community. And there will be ways to engage, um, you know, our own you know, people across SIACT in, in learning a little bit about AI and coding and things like that. And this is part of the sort of the general idea of us all working together and just getting those messages out there. So keep your eyes open for, for hackathons in the fall that will be using some of this data. That's gonna be very exciting. And um, 
there are also opportunities for people who actually, if they want to do some co uh, some coding work or some um, looking at images closely, so and training the data, there are they're looking for volunteer opportunities there too. So you might just find that special person where this is an interest, and if so, let us know.